Hello friends, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Jayadeep Shorangi, faculty, Department of English, Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, University of Calcutta, Kolkata. <coughs> friends, we are into module 24 and this is a special module on Thomas More's Utopia. This module is written by Dr. Madhumita Majumdar, who teaches English at Bhangor Mohabit Daloy, Kolkata. Friends, in this mod particular module, we are going to understand the implications of Thomas More's Utopia. We are to deal with Thomas More's biography, the consequences of publication of Utopia, date of its publication, its different issues, its implications and what the critics assess Utopia as a text. So, Friends, let us start with a little bit of biography of Thomas More. Sir Thomas More was born in the year 1478 and died in 1535. He was a noted Renaissance humanist and was an English lawyer. He was a social philosopher, author and a statesman. He was an important counsellor to Henry VIII and Lord Chancellor from October 1529 to May 16, 1532. He had among Erasmus's key collaborators in England along with John Cohet or Colette. They are the nucleus of a small group classically educated scholars formed during the reign of Henry VII, who dedicated themselves to ushering in an age where society would be governed by reason. Thomas More is famous for his publication of Utopia. Friends, we start discussions on Utopia through agenda. Thomas More's first famous work, Utopia, advocated the radical thought that the position of a king should be as an elective officer. Utopia remains till date one of the best books written on constitutional law. So, you can easily understand its relevance when it was published first. In the book, he sought to further much more long term processes of creating a citizenry capable of establishing a republic. So, there were a lot of discourse on republic. John Paul II says of more in his apostolic letter, in this context it is helpful to turn to the example of Saint Thomas More, who distinguished himself by his constant fidelity to legitimate authority and institutions, precisely in his intention to serve not power, but to supreme ideal of justice. His life teaches us the government is above all an exercise of virtue, unwavering in his rigorous moral stance and position this English statesman placed his own public activity at the service of the people and the person specifically if that person was weak or poor. He dealt with social controversies with superb sense of firmness. He was vigorously committed to favoring and defending the family. He supported the all round education of the young. His profound detachment from the honors and wealth, his serene and joyful humility, his balanced knowledge of knowledge that is based on human nature and the vanity of success, his certainty of judgment which is rooted in faith, these all gave him that confident inner strength that sustained him in adversity and in the face of death. 
His sanctity alone, forth in his martyrdom, but it has been prepared by an entire life of work devoted to God and neighbor. Friends, we should know the format of Utopia now. Thomas More wrote Utopia in the form of a dialogue, dialogue between himself and a fictional character. The name of this fictional character is Raphael Hythde. Raphael Hythde, who More states had sailed both geographically and intellectually as Ulysses and Plato. Moore says that the Raphael was well versed in philosophy. Learning Greek since the Romans left us, nothing does is valuable and that is except Seneca and Cicero. It is Raphael who described to Moore the imaginary land of Utopia. The land had achieved a fair higher level of civilization than contemporary Europe. Raphael speaks of the current practices of government and says that a counselor who advised a king to see himself as the guardian of his people and was also all likelihood to be rejected by the king in favor of other advisers who would tell them that the king must put his interest foremost. Now friends, at the heart of the core of the text, there goes the conception of welfare state. Expanding and elaborating on his idea of a welfare state, Thomas More brings up a dialogue. He had had at a dinner table in his former patron John Morton and says that the justice in a society is a foundation of such a state. Moore argues that the moral uplifting and not harsh punishments happen to be an effective method of carving crimes in the society. Moore draws a picture of a utopian government as a republic in which most government positions were to be elected. The prince, for example, was to be elected for life. Such a government, however, could function effectively if leaders were committed and that is at the heart of the crooks to the common good and it was important that people were capable of electing such leaders and competent enough to advise the government appropriately. <coughs> now friends, when was Utopia written? Utopia was written in Latin by Thomas More and what was written probably towards the close of 1515. The first part, the introductory part, early in 1516, the book got, per, per, the book got first printed at Lovian late in the year 1516 and it was under the editorship of Erasmus. <coughs> Peter Giles, the man responsible, other friends of Moore in Flanders. Moore later revised it and then got it printed by Frobenius at Basel in November 1518. It was printed at Paris and Vienna, but did not see the light of publications during the lifetime of Moore. So, it was posthumously published. It was first published as an English translation, one by Ralph Robinson in 1551. <coughs> now, friends, what is all about the book one? Book one, in presenting the negative side of his times, Thomas More intends to analyze what is wrong with the contemporary times and the civilization. Thereafter, this particular book makes incidental references comparing the state of affairs in a contemporary Europe with the ideal governance existing 
on the remote island called Utopia and the collaboration and elaboration of its views as, as the second book of Utopia. After dinner, Raffle sets out to give first a geographical detail of the island of Utopia in book 2. What is however notable that he does not specific details of its location on the map those specifics like length and circumstances are given to create a sense of a real place. So, all looked imaginary, but at the crack been presentation as real. Now, friends, Utopia is remembered as a text of code codified law of the land. Therefore, law of the land should be the most important subjective discourse that we should follow in Utopia. In Utopia, can there be lawyers? No, the answer is big no. <clears throat> the laws of the land were brief and readily understood by laymen. An accused person could plead his own case with assistance from the judge. Raffle launches a strong attack on lawyers, one of Sir Thomas More's many occupation, occupations. It speaks against those who speak to hear themselves and not to hear the subjects of their discourse. The lawyer is a proud hollow man and is held up to ridicule by Raffel and later by Sir Thomas More also. Friends, a text should be discussed as well as from the narrative style or the techniques of narration. So, let us talk about Utopia from the light of narrative style. Speaking of the narrative technique in the text, Moore is found alluding to the scholarly and traditional literature of his period as well as earlier Greek and Latin works. That Utopia is a different body of work is asserted. When we look the complete work on the best form of the commonwealth and the newsland of Utopia, a truly precious book, no less profitable than delightful by the most distinguished and learned gentleman Thomas More, citizen and under sheriff of the illustrious city of London. The book can be taken as a book on philosophy, travelogue, history, parable, at places a book on moral education as well as a fictional adventure story in prose. So, our readings will determine the capability and capacity of the book. Utopia, we realize, is a mixture of genres, where its introduction is a kind of postiche of different literary forms, including the poem, the pictogram, and the epistle, each used to achieve a definite end. So, you can easily understand how the narrative technique is so innovative, so pluralistic and so acceptable by the common re readers. Now, education in Utopia. Education is one of the agendum being discussed in this particular text. Utopia also speaks of an advanced system of universal education which is prevalent. In Moore's Utopia, the entire population works and there is no aristocratic class. Thus, everyone in Utopia has free time, leisure time for study. Does it not remind, does it not remind us Gonzalo's speech in the Commonwealth in Shakespeare's The Tempest? Among the subjects that the book suggests, 
should be taken up are music, geometry and astronomy. This holistic approach is like the classical Greeks. Friends, after education comes the religion. Thomas More's Utopia is a masterpiece where the codes of religions are discussed. Thomas More belonged to England that was theocratic and it was natural that he saw the above stated idea of the general welfare state as completely coherent with the teachings of Jesus Christ. In the books, More opines that Christianity was coherent with reason. More did not support Martin Luther's doctrine that denied free or freedom. More thought that Luther's doctrine was against faith and deny Christ and thus come to deny the value of works and do not bring them to good living. Friends, now clothes and home in Ethiopia. Equally it is reflected that the homogeneous nature of houses built, they were not only uniform but also un uh, unpretentious. The people were people used to wear simple clothes. The basic unit of the society was the family and the oldest member of the governor of the family. Thirty families put themselves off a great hall, eating together the food made by women and it were elaborately discussed in this particular text. Divorce was permissible, but only under specific circumstances. So, Utopia has a social bias and it is a socially committed work. Now, there should not be a text of high repute like Utopia without any reference to economy of the time. We learn a free economy where markets were no more than supply houses from where one could take that one needed without money. Currency thus was not used in the land of Utopia. I think it sounds funny to many of your ears. Let me repeat it. Currency thus was not used in the land of Utopia. The surplus produce would be sold to foreign countries and wealth got in exchange went straight to the state ex exchequer. Naturally, the utopians had no private property and the wealth acquired through trade and foreign countries was used only during the time of war. War is regarded as inhuman and something hostile to mankind. And in utopia it is mentioned that war should be ad avoided as much as practically possible. Friends, Utopia has the vision of new world, the world beyond the world that we live in. Finally, the idea of travel up to the new world is an obvious theme in Utopia. It is not possible to travel to Utopia as the route to it quite dangerous. Hence, the best option is to hear what Raffle has to say. The time in which Moore lived, it was not uncommon to hear of tales of strange lands. This is exactly the motif of Moore uses in this particular book. It is thus convenient for Moore not to dismiss the idea that Utopia was located somewhere in the new world, somewhere in the imaginary space. Friends, we shall conclude by summing up 
what the critics think about the text. Major critics supporting the idea that Utopia had communist leaning and we must refer to Kutsky, J. H. Hexeter and Helgerson, Dorsey and Heisman spoke of Lucian satire's influence on this particular text. Single interpretation of the text is impossible. So, the text survives with multiple layers of interpretations. This book is nevertheless a very good example of a book on the idea of welfare state. So, friends, in this module, we try to map out utopia as a relevant text and different issues discussed in Thomas More's utopia. I hope you enjoyed this particular module very much. Thank you. Thomas More's utopia is an opportunity for us as a class to begin to engage a very long tradition um, in both philosophy and literature that's concerned with what would constitute a good life or how is it that people should live both by themselves and with other people um, so that they could have you know the best possible experience of life. As we discussed in class there are a number of texts that might be used to contextualize utopia virtually none of which we have an opportunity to read in our course this semester, but we were thinking about things like um, The Republic uh, by Plato, we were thinking about things like The Politics by Aristotle, and then we were also trying to move forward a little bit into the early modern period, which is where we are now kind of looking around for the next couple of weeks, certainly as we engage Spencer's The Fairy Queen um, and Utopia. We were thinking about the writings of Machiavelli, uh, which are publicized, or I should say the prince is publicized, at about the same point in time that the Utopia comes out. And we thought a little bit about looking at uh, Utopia and the prince as two very different assessments of the world um, at, during kind of the early years of the, um, the 16th century. One of the, one of the things that we might consider, of course, is that these are different genres in terms of the text that we're engaging. And there's a lot of question about surrounding how seriously should we take, you know, Thomas More's uh, Utopia to begin with. Um, is this a tongue-in-cheek, you know, uh, description of the way a society might be? I think there are a number of factors that we certainly need to consider, um, certainly around the, the writing of this document that would be relevant, you know, for our class discussions. And I think for us at this stage, we can begin that conversation by thinking about whether or not we would like to live in utopia. And a number of you said that you would, uh, several of you said that you wouldn't, um, and that was, I thought, pretty fascinating because, you know, if you think about what the ramifications would be uh, for the individual if, if they lived in utopia, and many of you said that that would be perfectly fascinating fine and then when we push that conversation even further and we thought about you know uh, what does it mean for an individual to live um, a, a, a meaningful life um, and can a meaningful life be an interchangeable life as many of the lives appear to be on or in, in, in the utopian community uh, many of you seem perfectly fine uh, with this idea of having an interchangeable life and the idea that you know you could simply live within a certain construct and go through all the necessary steps that you would be expected to go through by your society and then that would be fine uh, as a total kind of experience. Others of you expressed some horror at that idea, uh, the notion that your entire life you know, could be planned out, regulated, administered in such a way um, so that by the time you were you know, 15 or 30 or 45 or 60, you know, all the basic necessities would just be there for you um, and you wouldn't need to do much um, except follow the rules. And I think this is going to be a really interesting thing for us to, to engage as we think about you know, the Fairy Queen coming up. But coming back to uh, Utopia, um, one of the 
questions or one of the concerns that was brought up in class was how closely does this rec resemble kind of contemporary modern day American society as you understand it. And many of us found parallels that we could make between our understanding of the world and the world that was represented in this text. I was really encouraged by the classroom discussions that we had um, and the, the, the arguments that started to appear along the way. One of the things we can think about, you know, in terms of all the texts we're reading this semester, we looked at, at Dante as kind of an invitation to literature. We looked at Chaucer as kind of a, um, a way to think about what the English major is um, you know, regarding society with a critical eye and commenting on what you see as best you can. And then we were looking at the utopia and what we're understanding now is that there's this broader conversation about what a good society is and how it is we might enter into it. So if you're seeing kind of this uh, this hierarchy of interests that you know, that's intentional and that's that's part of the course and I think a big part of the English major is figuring out where it is you feel comfortable um, in this in this kind of ladder uh, not that they're necessarily you know sharp designations between all of these things but you know some people find readings to be much more interesting that are focused on broad social issues other find you know personal narratives to be far more entertaining um, what I want you to see is that regardless of where you look in this early material there's this continuing clash as I I've said at several points between the classical world and, and, and the Catholic world or the Christian world as it's quickly becoming uh, through reformations in England and, and, and Martin Luther and things like that. So one of the questions you might ask yourself is as an English major potentially or as someone who's interested in the English field, you know, is there a particular kind of story that or, or, or written piece of work that you find to be interesting? And I ask that question not simply randomly but because we're starting to do our research for our you know, short papers. And as we do our research, you're going to be introduced into yet another many of you brand new, you know, facet of the literary world, and that is the world of contemporary scholarship. And what I really hope you get from this is this sense that the documents we're reading are not dead documents, that there are people all over the world who are engaging them critically, as you are, and struggling with their meaning, struggling with their implications, and continuing to work with the ideas that are found in these books. Um, and in this way, the literature we're engaging, some of which is, you know, 700, 800 years old in some, in some examples and instances, is still as relevant to, um, you know, uh, scholarly communities um, today as, as it has been over the, several, the last several hundred years. And when you start to make that connection, you, you start to make another association for yourself, and that is, I am part of this tradition of criticism. I am part of this tradition of inquiry. And not only am I part of it, but I can actually, be, I can actually engage it and, and, and contribute to it through my own reading, through my own writing, uh, which can be a very you know, exciting thing uh, for students who are just beginning to engage this field for the first time. So if we think about where Utopia falls kind of in the, in the, in the spectrum of the works we've been reading this semester, um, we might look at it that way and we might think about its implications in that way. And um, I think that will set us up for what's about to happen, which is an opportunity for us to break out of the real world entirely in, in The Fairy Queen, which is where we're going next, um, in which, you know, Thomas More would never claim to visit um, um, any of the locations that are represented um, in, this, uh, in this poem. And for example, he would probably, and this will make more sense in class uh, at a later date, he probably would have, you know, would have been very much against uh, fighting the Red Cross Knight as he's represented at certain points in the reading for today. Anyway, I'm looking forward to your responses on The Fairy Queen. It's a very challenging read uh, and we'll spend some extra time with it as a result, but it is certainly worth it. I'll see you in class. Bye.